Uh, I have been praying. I have a list with all of your names on it that I pray through. And uh, I have been praying specifically that whatever it is that you need in your life, this Christmas season, that you would experience a Christmas miracle. It may not make the Hallmark Channel. It may not make the movie of the week. But I believe every one of us have things in our life that we are believing for a miracle. And I, I just want that for you. I, I want that in my life. Oh, as, as we continue to pray for a lost son, oh, there's nothing greater in my life that I pray for uh, than wanting to see my son come back to Christ. And I know that you have miracles that you need in your life as well. Well, week one, we talked about the miracle of the moment and how Christ came at exactly the moment when God said it was the perfect time to come. And it's a reminder for us that as believers in Christ, that God's timing is still perfect. His timing is still perfect. Uh, in the, in the, the movie series that we're doing on Sunday night, tonight we were going to be doing Abraham and Isaac. And it is, it's one of the most powerful ones in this movie series. Uh, I, I've, sat and I've watched it twice now and have cried through it both times because of the timing of God, uh, how God provides. And... We just need to, to, to be able to trust in that fact that God's timing is perfect. Last week we talked about the miracle of the message, that God's message has not changed. That from the beginning of time till now, God's message is still a message of redemption. That Christ came to redeem mankind. And today we're going to talk about the miracle of the method. One of the mysteries and the miracles of Christmas that fascinated me as a child uh, when I believed in Santa Claus was how did Santa deliver all those toys? Now, Jesse, I, I know you probably have this, you're still wondering, how does Santa, how does he deliver all of these toys in one night, okay? And in the movie, and we've had some technical difficulties working this out, so I don't have a movie clip to play for you today from the Miracle on 34th Street. But in the, in the movie, the Miracle on 34th Street, the original one back from 1947, they didn't really answer the question, okay? It is implied, you know, you have the little boy that comes and sits on Santa's lap, and he wants a train or a fire truck, and he ends up sending his mother to another store, if you know the storyline, uh, so that the mother is the one providing the present. But Santa helps set that up. Later in the movie, when they're in the court case, uh, the little boy from the, the prosecutor uh, is called to the stand, and he says well, he believes in Santa Claus because his daddy told him that there is a Santa Claus and, you know, my daddy would never lie to me. It's a great moment in that movie. Uh, but when he's on the stand, he says, I want a special uh, football. And so that the dad says when the thing's all over, i got to get to the store and buy that football. And so Santa has again facilitated, and then later he talks about how he needs to go out and help those who, didn't, who aren't going to get a gift from anywhere else. So that's how the old movie goes. Since then... Man, there are all kinds of ways that movies have interpreted that, that, you know, there's a time continuum, and either time slows down, or the sled goes really fast, uh, or time stops, whatever it is. But there's lots of different methods, and some of you are looking at me like, what does that have to do with the Christmas story, Okay. What in the world does that have to do with the Christmas story? And I'm glad you asked, because part of the Christmas miracle is the method in which God used. In Paul writes in Romans chapter 11, he says, 
Oh, how great are God's riches and wisdom and knowledge. How impossible it is for us to understand His decisions and His ways. And today I want to talk about that very thing, that God's methods, first of all, are beyond our comprehension. Now, we now live in a world where it has to fit in our comprehension or we don't accept it. Okay, that is the world we live in now. There can't be a God factor. If I can't explain it, if I can't, if I can't get it, then you know, there, it's not about faith. It is, it has to be for me. Or, But God's methods can be beyond our comprehension. And he does not have to explain it to us so that we get it. Okay? Sometimes we may get it. Sometimes we may not get it. Okay? Paul in this doxology of praise focuses on the greatness of God and how absolutely wonderful he is. His riches, his wisdom, his knowledge. They are beyond measure. His ways, his methods of doing things are even beyond our understanding. And honestly, when we think about God's methods throughout history, and particularly in this Christmas story, it makes about as much sense as some of Santa's theories for getting all those toys delivered on time in one night. I believe that if we were writing the script for redemption of man, that we probably would not have made the same choices that God made we would probably choose that the sky would open and God would just reveal His Son to us and He would come with on the white horse as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. No one would doubt if everybody saw Christ coming like that. Yet, God sent His Son as a helpless, defenseless baby. We would probably choose that he be born in a palace. Here's the Son of God. We're going to find the nicest place on earth, and that's where he's coming if he's going to have to be born a baby. But instead, God chose a stable. Not even, you know, we, we would probably at least choose a family of wealth or at least a middle class family. But God chose humble, poor parents. We would choose parents who had some kind of influence, but God chose parents with no worldly influence. They were plain, they were ordinary, they were even obscure individuals that would have never found a place in history books had it not, God, had it not been that God said, I am. Choose you. He chose to reveal himself in the greatest and grandest way possible when he chose a method that we would be able to comprehend and understand. In Isaiah chapter 55, it says, My thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord. For my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. See, God's methods, the second part of this, is that God's methods are different than our methods. They're not just beyond our comprehension, but they're different. And we shouldn't be surprised at God's methods. When we look through the Old Testament, we see that God chose Abraham. Abram at that point. And he picked this guy who lived in an obscure place and he told him, I want you to go to a different place. Where do you want me to go? I will direct you along the path. And God began this journey that he would bless the whole world through the seed of of Abraham. He chose this guy who, in, in time, no baby, no baby, 
no baby, no baby. He's getting older and older, and the promise is that God is going to bless the world through his seed. In fact, he tells him to go out and look at the stars, count the stars. When you're done counting the stars, that's how many inheritance you're in, in, in not inheritance. What am I saying? What's the word? What? Offspring will work. That's how many offspring that you're going to have. Okay? I don't know what word was in my head. But here God chose this guy who we probably wouldn't choose. God chose Joseph, not the oldest brother, not the youngest brother, second to youngest brother. And God chose him that not only would Joseph be the deliverer for his family, but Joseph would be the deliverer for God's people Israel they would have been destroyed in that famine, and God chose Joseph and raised him up by going and being sold by his brothers, accused of rape and in prison. I mean, this guy's story is incredible, but God has a, path, a plan and a path all along that's going to put Joseph at the right place at the right time for God's will to be accomplished. God's methods are different than our methods. Oh, God chose the small country of Israel. He chose a people who would be a, they were chosen for service. Okay? They weren't the greatest nation. They never became the greatest nation. They never ruled the world as other countries did. But God chose that small nation to say, you are going to do a work of service for me. And God's still not done with the country of Israel. If you wonder in end times where part of that's going, God, it's because God is not done with the country of Israel. God chose David, the, 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 the last, the youngest of his brothers, when the prophet was sent to anoint the king, all the brothers passed before him. And none of them were picked. David hadn't even been invited to the party. Do you have any more sons? Oh, yeah, one. You don't need to see him. He's just, he just a shepherd boy. He's out with the sheep. We didn't even call him in. Go get him. As soon as the prophet sees him, boom, Samuel anoints him as the next king of Israel. And it would be years in that journey before he actually became king. But God chose the insignificant to serve in his perfect plan at his perfect place. And one of the cities in Israel, the lowly forgotten Bethlehem, prophesied hundreds of years before the birth of Christ, before the, that the Messiah would come there. And God chose Bethlehem. Not a center of activity, not a center of culture, not a center of, of, of politics, but lowly, forgotten Bethlehem. Because God's ways are not our ways. His methods are different. And he begins, as we look at all of those things, to see that God is revealing to us this pattern. Over and over again, God chooses the ordinary so that he can do extraordinary things through them. Man, I hear that and I think, man, I'm glad to hear that news. I, I'm a kid from Iowa who lived in the middle of cornfields. Oh, I, I'm a kid that when I told my youth pastor, hey, I feel called into ministry, his words were, oh, God's called way better people than you. Okay. I, okay. okay. It wasn't, oh, yes, we have seen this in your life, and we know it's going to be great. No, not at all. Not at all. But see, I'm glad that God looked to an insignificant farm kid in Iowa and says, I choose you. I choose you. I had the opportunity at, at a pastor's conference. As many of you will know the name Tommy Barnett. He pastors a church of 
between 10 and 15,000 people in uh, Phoenix, Arizona. He started off in, in uh, Davenport, Iowa as the, as the uh, pastor there. And uh, one of our children's pastors from our church had served under him and uh, did bus ministry. They do an incredible bus ministry. If you think we do bus ministry, no, we do not. It, it's nothing compared to that. But I had the opportunity to sit by his mom in this service, and you had to get to the service hours ahead. And so I wanted to, in one of the sessions, it's a big place, uh, thousands of people, and I wanted to sit on the main floor and be close and see what was happening. So I got there like four hours early so I could get a good seat. So I'm sitting there, and, and early comes, the, the, there's reserved seats right next to me. And so still pretty early, in comes this woman, and she parks herself, and she begins to talk to me, and she begins to tell me, uh, who she is, and she's Tommy Barnett's mom. And she begins to say that, that her and her husband told Tommy that he needed to go to the city, that God had called him to the city, and you need to go to the city where the most people are because that's where you're going to reach the most people. And every preacher should go to the city to reach the most people. And even as she is speaking to me and telling me this, I am thinking... And hearing the voice of God say to me, that's not what I want for you. Now, here's this lady who I have all the respect in the world for. Okay? She's on a pedestal to me. And she's telling me something that makes sense, great sense. Go to where the people are because you're going to reach the most people. And yet throughout my life, God has continued to place me in places that are not about going to the city. When we went to El Salvador, we went up to this mountain and met with these people who were literally forgotten people. And God broke our hearts for those people because we can, you, you, know, you can go to the city of San Salvador, but God loves the people on that mountain just as much. And somebody needs to be there to love on them and reach them. Oh, and it just shows us that God's methods are way different than ours. In Luke chapter 2, the Christmas story reads, At the time of the Roman emperor, Augustus declared that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire, and all returned to their own ancestral towns to register for the census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home, and he traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. He took with him Mary, to whom he was engaged, who was now expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for them. Motel 6 did not leave the light on that night. There is no vacancy anywhere for them. You know, a miracle of miracles would have been that God would have made sure that there was at least one room available. How hard would that have been for the God of gods? The king of all kings is to be born, and there's no room. See, God's method isn't our method. They ended up staying in a, in a barn, in a manger, I'm telling you, that has become such a pretty word. Oh, we lay way in a manger. That's a pretty word. Okay? How many know what a manger is not a pretty thing? Oh, uh, Joseph, being the good husband that he was, I can imagine that he tried to clean out the trough, okay, and get some clean straw in it, try to move the manure away. Oh, but understand, it was still a barn. It was still a stable where there were animals. And then to celebrate the occasion, to announce Christ's birth, God sends angels. And instead of sending them to the most influential people on earth who could have helped herald this announcement everywhere? God, in His method, chooses lowly shepherds 
who were just carrying out their responsibility one more night in Bethlehem Hills. Luke 2 records it that that night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. And they were terrified. But the angel reassured them, do not be afraid. He said, I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, in the city of David. And you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth lying in a manger. And suddenly, the angel was joined by a vast host of others. The armies of heaven praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to those whom God has pleased. So instead of kings and queens and nobility, God chose shepherds. God chose to make this grandest announcement ever given to earth through some of the lowliest people on the earth. And the more you think about it, the more incredible the story becomes that God's ways are not our ways. That His methods may not make any sense. And part of the miracle, this Christmas miracle of the method, is that God's method is beyond our comprehension. It's different than our methods. And the good news is, is that God's methods include us. Now just stop to think about that. God's methods include you. They include me. Ordinary people called to do extraordinary things. Think about the miracle of this method for a moment. Following his resurrection from the dead, Jesus first appeared to a group of women, and then his disciples. He did not go to the temple. He did not go to the next meeting of the Sanhedrin or the Pharisees, the religious leaders, which I'm telling you by man's methods, I'm thinking if I'm planning this, that's the place I'm going. As God of the universe, I'm going to make sure that the Pharisees and the Sanhedrins and all the religious leaders are somehow come together to have this huge convocation. Okay, And while they're all together... Jesus is coming, strolling in to say, I told you so. Okay? In my method, my thought process, I'm like, there's got to be a little I told you so in here. Oh, th that's how we think. I'm going to show you. From a human perspective, we would write the script so that Jesus rose from the dead and then return to Jerusalem to prove to all of those people that he was right. But God's plan was different. He reveals himself first to the women and then to the followers, and then he gave them the responsibility of going to the world to go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that He had commanded. And to that small group of believers, of followers, Jesus entrusts the good news of salvation for the whole world. That has always boggled my mind. That has always boggled me. Since I was a teenager in the Bible quiz program and learning the Word of God, this has always been something that boggled my mind. Why? Why did God choose that method? There had to be something better. There had to be something bigger. There had to be something more efficient than leaving it up to us. Now, he knew we wouldn't be able to do it by ourselves. And so that's why he sent the Holy Spirit to give us power that we would be equipped 
to go and do it because he knew we needed help. We needed his help. But he still left it up to people who could say, no thank you. And we now live in a world where Christians check witnessing on a box like it is optional. Yes, I'm a follower of Christ. No, I choose not to be a fisher of men. Oh, even though Jesus said, come follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. We love the first part, come follow me, I'm following, I'm following, be a fisher of men. No, thank you. That makes me uncomfortable. I don't have the gift of evangelism. And so we exclude ourselves. We have that choice that we can do that. And God entrusted this message to us. Paul commented on this miracle of the method about how God uses ordinary people when he wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Remember, dear brothers and sisters, that few of you were wise in the world's eyes or powerful or wealthy when God called you. Instead, God chose things the world considers foolish in order to shame those who think they are wise. And he chose things that are powerless to shame those who are powerful. God chose things despised by the world, things counted as nothing at all, and used them to bring to nothing what the world considers important. And as a result, no one can ever boast in the presence of God. No one is ever going to go to heaven and say to God, I, got I didn't need your help to get here. I got here because I was a great guy. I became a great leader. I was president. I was whatever. No one gets to go on their own merit. No one. God has chosen the foolish things to confound the wise. See, it is good for us that God can use the simplest of vessels to accomplish great things. God has entrusted to us the good news of salvation. But there's another aspect to this miracle of the method that we need to understand, and that's this last part, is that in the same way that we don't understand and we don't comprehend everything, that God is at work in our lives in ways that we do not and cannot fully understand. How many wish you just had the corner of the market on knowing your future? Right? Some of us would like, we'd like to think, oh yeah, I'd like to know my future. I'll bet you you wouldn't. I'll bet you if you could see it for a day, you'd say, oh, you know what, no, too much. Let me just live this thing out. No? Or if God took you five, down, five years down the road and showed you this, you'd think, well, how did I get there? Well, most of us are given our future one moment at a time because that's what we can handle is one moment at a time. In the same way that we would have written the script differently for the redemption of mankind, I think that all of us would write out the plan for our own lives differently. Even in the plan of, of sanctification and in our becoming Christ-like, okay, wouldn't you write it a little different that you come to Christ and on the day that you receive Christ, that you pray that sinner's prayer and you surrender your life to Him, wouldn't it be much better if at that moment everything in your life changed and you got everything you wanted? Wouldn't it be great if at that moment you never had another bad thought? Wouldn't it be great if you were never tempted in anything ever again? Wouldn't it be great if every time you say, hey God, I want, that it just magically appeared, whatever it was? Wouldn't it be great if you never had to struggle with anything ever again? No, if we were writing the story, we would truly write it as, I give my life to Christ, and there began the sweet by and by. Unfortunately, we don't get to live in the sweet by and by. 
we get to live in the nasty now and now. Right? The sweet by and by is, is coming, but it's not now. Oh, we experience problems. We experience pains. We experience pressure. We experience struggles and sickness. We experience temptation and failure. Sometimes it seems we take one step forward only to be knocked two steps backwards. And our lives are full of these celebrations, victories, but they're accompanied by defeats and sometimes despair. And I don't think that any of us would write the script that way. I can't answer the question, why do things happen in your life? Oh, I, I wish I could answer the question, why did this missionary couple die? I, I struggle with things like that, probably like you do. Here's someone that has given their life to go and serve as a foreign missionary on foreign soil. And we pray for God's protection over them. And somehow in the middle of that, they still die. And it's the reminder that none of us have the promise of tomorrow. We're all supposed to be serving the Lord wherever we're at, doing whatever we do, but we understand that none of us have the promise that we will be here tomorrow. None of us. I can tell you that regardless of what we go through, that we are not left to despair. That we truly can rely, as believers, we can truly rely on the truth of God's Word when He promises we know that all things work together for good. Don't stop there, as many people do. For those who love God and are called according to His purpose. For that, is a, that, is, that is not a verse for non-believers. Even though many of them will hang it on their wall or tattoo it on their arm. Okay? It is a promise for believers, followers of Christ. For those who love God and are called according to His purpose, we can rely on the truth of God's Word that He promises to come into those moments of despair, of sickness, whatever it may be, and promises to make something good out of it. You know, as we look at this, this missionary couple, you think, how can anything good come out of that? How can anything good come out of that? I'm reminded our missionaries in Vietnam, the Wyatts, they have a son that they work with uh, that's on the mission field with them. They're in Vietnam as well. But they had another son. His name was Joe. He's a friend of mine from camp. And Joe had been away from God and running very, very wild. And Joe gave his life to Christ. And then he got sick. And then he died. And that's a hard, he's young. And it's very hard to wrap your brain around that, what good could come out of that. But through Joe's transformation, there were lots of people that came to know Christ after he had passed away. And, you know, we don't understand the, the why of that. And the hurt and the pain for that family is, is probably still very, very real. But God knows what he's doing. And as hard as that is sometimes to accept, as followers of Christ, we have to get our minds set on this earth is not all there is. The bigger picture is that God has prepared for us this incredible place where none of that junk is going to happen forever. I can tell you this, and I say this often at funerals. Life at any age is too short. And the older I get, the more I believe that. 
Oh, when I was a young man and someone who was 89 passed away, I thought, oh man, they were old. But having lost my grandma at age 89, having lost Dorothy at age 89, I would much rather they stuck around a little longer. Oh, 89 wasn't all that old. But the reality of it is, if we live to be 110, life is still short. It's still short. It's just the brevity of life. That's why scripture says it's like a vapor. It's like you, it's mist. It comes out of your tea kettle. You see it? Where'd it go? It's gone. That's how our lives are in comparison to eternity. So we've got to get the eternity part right. When the angel appeared to Mary to tell her that she was going to have a baby, that the Holy Spirit was going to overshadow her, and that there would be a child conceived in her, she could have not ever begun to figure out all that was going to mean for her. She couldn't have known that. No way she could have known that 33 years later, that she would have to watch that son die. Not just die a death as, as humans do, but to die as he was paying the price for the sin of all mankind. She could have never known that. Oh, we, we sing the song, Mary, did you know? Did you know? Did you know? And sometime the Catholic version of that is that Mary had all this power and she knew she was a simple, ordinary girl that God used to do extraordinary things. But did she know? I'm going to guess not. The verse that keeps coming up is it says that she pondered all these things in her heart. She just tucked them away. Kind of as parents, we, know how, we, we do that with our kids, don't we? We have those moments and we just tuck that away. We, we ponder it in our hearts. Joseph had no idea when the angel came to him, uh, after he had already decided what he was going to do, he needed angel intervention to make the right choice. And so the angel came to him, and he had no idea what the future was going to bring. The future for them, no doubt, brought shame, accusation, embarrassment, and ridicule. There's no way, especially in the Jewish community, there's no way that that did not happen. But they also got to experience the miracle of seeing God become flesh right before their very eyes. They saw God. See, the cost of their obedience paid off by them getting to draw near to God. My mom likes to cross stitch. It's the little things. Sometimes it has a picture on there and then you go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And she's done some really cool, she's made some, I have one of them hanging in my office. And she's done some really cool things over the years that she's given out to our family. But if you've ever had the opportunity to flip that thing over and see the backside, it's a mess back there. Okay? Crazy how that can become something so nice. Corey Tin Boom, who was, was as when I was a teenager, she was traveling with Billy Graham, and the Hiding Place movie came out, and, and uh, I, I really was attracted to all of that and her story. And one of the things that she wrote and shared was a story uh, or a poem that. That she, and I'm, I'm not sure. I think that she wrote it. I, I saw somewhere else that somebody says, no, she didn't write it. She just shared it, but they never didn't know who the author is. So I really don't know. But it was something that meant a lot to her either way. So I share it not knowing. But it simply goes like this. My life is but a weaving between my God and me. I do not choose the colors. He worketh steadily. Oft times he weaveth sorrow, and I in foolish pride forget he sees the upper and I the underside. And not till the, the loom is silent and the shuttle ceases to fly will God unroll the canvas 
and explain the reason why that the dark threads were as needful in the skillful weaver's hands as the threads of gold and silver in the pattern he has planned. It's one of the first poems that I ever memorized as a teenager. And it's always stuck with me through my life. And I think, you know, God is at work making this beautiful thing. And it may not be perfect and may have its blemishes. But when, when we're done, when our life is over, and we, present, we are presented in heaven, it's going to be a beautiful thing. From our perspective on earth, sometimes we see the back of the embroidery, forgetting that sometimes that, hey, once one day this gets flipped over, and it's beautiful. We're looking at the underside. We don't understand sometimes, why is that so ugly, or why is this so confusing, or why didn't I get that right? Why are there so many knots? Why, why, are, why are there so many dark colors? Why are there so many random directions? But one day, we get to see that from the top and see what throughout our life that God has been doing. We'll be able to see how the seasons of pain brought some rich and vibrant colors. We'll see the fullness and the richness of the design as it's reflected through the joys, the seasons of joy and celebration. We'll see the depth of our character revealed through the times of testing and trusting Him. So we have to continue trusting Him that He is working our tapestry, our picture for His good. The miracle of the method is that God is at work in our lives. God is at work in your lives. Man, it is my, it's my prayer that as we go through this Christmas season and through into this next year, that we embrace it and, and see, God, we're going to be celebrating New Year's in two weeks. And that seems to be the time for many to pause and reflect and make uh, resolutions. So now I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And we do that through January and start over in February. But we make all those resolutions because we're, we're thinking through our lives of what we want to be different and what we'd like to do better. And God is at work in our lives, wanting the very best for us. Wanting His will to be done in our lives. And, and, and it's my prayer that we would embrace that and say, God, your plan may not be my plan. My plan may not be your plan, but I'm going to submit my plan to your will. Because it's more important that I'm obedient to you and your plan for my life than that I get my way. Today, I, I want to I close in prayer. And I, I want us just to take a moment before God. Because there may be things in your past that you've struggled with. There may be difficult things and maybe deaths that you've gone through and experienced that you didn't understand the why and you still struggle with that. And maybe it's time just to let that go and say, God, I'm going to trust you. I don't have to understand it, but I'm going to stop letting that hurt me, and I'm going to start letting your Holy Spirit just work through me. And I truly believe that if we're open with our lives, that God will put people in our paths who we can minister to even better because of the past that we've already experienced. I don't know how he always does that, but he seems to do that. That he will put people in your path who you will be able to share with and be able to say, you know what, I've been through that. Maybe not know exactly, but I've been through a little of that. 
And you're going to be able to minister to them in a way that you couldn't before you went through that. Father, today I just thank you for each and every one. And Father, I just pray for all of us here that as we have heard your word today, that we would be encouraged that we would be encouraged that you are on the throne and in control. And I thank you. I thank you for your Holy Spirit, and I pray that today that you would just continue to speak to our hearts and our lives, and that you would do a beautiful thing. Let us know that You are wanting the best for us. And your best may be different than what we have pictured. But we want what you want. And we surrender our hearts and we surrender our lives to your will, to your plan, your method, even though it may not be what we have laid out. And we surrender to you, our Lord and Savior. And Father, I thank you today, and I praise you for it, in your mighty name, amen, amen. God's good, is he not? Amen. I pray you have a great week. On your way out today, uh, Dale has prepared some uh, bags of candy and, and fruit for us, for all of us, so make sure you tell him thank you for that, but he's right there. You want to do it on the door if they come out, or you want to get them while they're sitting? Okay, he's going to do it while you're sitting, so don't move.